Okay, let's start the final panel, uh, which I am honored to moderate. Uh, <clears throat> I admired Fred's organization. Uh, couldn't be said the other way around. Uh, um, but uh, as a result, uh, I'm gonna uh, introduce the panelists in whichever order I wrote them down rather than some organized order. But I'll begin with ladies first. So Mary uh, Witten in, uh, interrupted her engineering education at, at North Carolina State to co-found Iconus Graphic Systems. It's already been said how important Iconus was to the, the development of graphics at, at our department. Uh, what I'll add to that was um, that my collaborations with the Radiation Oncology Department led to them buying, I don't remember if, whether, whether it was uh, number three or number four, I think it was number four also, um, so that UNC had two of the last four, they, um, they bought an Iconis because they thought it was, would really importantly affect the collaboration between radiation oncology and computer science, and so it did. In any case, uh, Mary also uh, went on to, a found co-found uh, transept systems uh, in 1986 uh, and they sold uh, designed and sold high-end user programmable graphic systems and software libraries for graphics image processing volume rendering visualization etc uh, her major contribution there was a user programmable matrix multiplier a system component that was an early press predecessor of the uh, tensor units in today's gpus <laughs> Um, Mary came to UNC in 95 with a master's degree in both computer engineering and psychological tests and measurement, and both were very important in the, her research contributions. Uh, uh, she uh, co-led with Fred the EVE, the Effective Vir Virtual Environments Research Team here, and uh, she attained the, the rank of research professor. Uh, of course, Eve worked on improving virtual and mixed reality experience, launched the research areas of redirected walking and passive haptics, and were pioneers in the use of physiological measurements to evaluate stress-inducing virtual environments. They measured sweat. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, for those accomplishments, among my, others, uh, Mary received the 2021 IEEE uh, VGTC Virtual Reality Career Award. He's now a retired research professor. Uh, Gary Bishop has the most amazing collection of uh, roles in the computer science department. Uh, he already had a uh, business experience. And so when he enrolled as a grad student in spring 1999, which he ended in, in 84, uh, Fred, uh, we were, we had had an executive officer. You heard the story about, about Jim Robb being the first and it was followed by a man named John, John Lenars and John was leaving. And uh, Fred noted that his entering graduate student had all these unbelievable administrative experience. And so simultaneously, Gary was a grad student and executive officer of the department. <laughs> uh, and he did that through the summer of, of 81. He, he uh, then became an adjunct research faculty member in 91 and did a whole lot of interesting research in uh, re related to devices for tracking and, and for virtual reality applications. And uh, then he got on the tenure track finally in 1997 uh, and during his time as faculty member, he re returned to some administrative responsibilities as associate chair and retired in 2021. Uh, during his time at, as a faculty member, he led a, a beautiful direction of work, uh, which I guess he called something like geeks doing well, for, doing good for the world, uh, and uh, which helped handicapped people around do really uh, effective things using using computers. Uh, uh, and so he, these days he's working with colleagues 
at the Center for Literacy and Disability Studies in the School of Medicine and on a School of Prototyping Communication Devices for People Who Are Unable to Speak, following on, on, on that work. Uh, Ben's next on my list, so I will tell you about Ben Locke. Uh, I, I was Fred's student, he says, from 2000 to 2002, and presently a, a professor in the Computer and Information Sciences and Engineering Department at the University of Florida, where he started in 2003. He's also an entrepreneur, having co-founded Shadow Health, now a part of Elsevier, to pardon the Dutch pronunciation of the proper of that company, uh, and uh, to commercialize in innovations from his research lab. Uh, finally, Ron Azuma, he tells that most of his contact with Fred from, was from 88 to 95, while he was a grad student here under Fred. <clears throat> and he's currently a principal engineer at Intel Labs in Silicon Valley. Um, so uh, I th you'll see we cover many years in this panel. Uh, and for sure, we cover the last uh, years of Fred's uh, research and uh, advising that went into, into virtual, what people call virtual reality these days, but aug augmented and, and, and virtual environments. And uh, we're gonna start with Mary who worked so closely with him uh, in, in that area. Thanks, Dave. Peter Kellengart said this morning, Fred is Fred. And when I thought about it, Fred was just always this presence and really a huge presence. And then I said, well, I've got to say something besides that. <laughs> and I finally, you know, I've never thought seriously, and he liked you to think seriously about things, um, about what a mentor he was. I came out of an industrial um, environment when I came to the university. He and Henry said, you, got, you want to come over here and run the graphics lab? And I said, oh, please don't throw me in that briar patch. <laughs> so I, um, I came over and, and that was that, and I never left. I never thought I would stay. Um, but I, both to transition to an academic career and to prosper in it. So I, I have a great deal of respect for that. I once read a Harvard Business School paper that talked about how good managers give you different levels of supervision depending on how experienced you are in your job. When you're new, you need a lot of um, training and supervision and then it lessens over time. And I, looking after I read the paper, I said, hmm, I've seen that in, in action. I learned some great things from Fred, writing proposals. Um, when you're doing financials, I come out of industrial, we had been audited by the federal government one time was awful. Um, and so I was, I was being very picky about my numbers. And I went to Fred and I said, you know, how, how careful do I have to be? And he says, oh, this one should be about this amount of money. And he was left-handed. And this one should be about this amount of money. And, and then it adds up and it's less than the amount that they would award. So it's good enough for government work. So <laughs> um, he had a real respect for management. And I think that that was, uh, that was something that really very much impressed me. Where does the buck stop? He, he wrote one time in the management section of a proposal, consensus is nice, but cannot always be achieved. When it can't, after reasonable consultation with the team, the PI will make the decision. And that has always stuck with me. That was fundamentally wrong at Sun. Do you oh, agree? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like fundamentally broken at Sun. <laughs> Tell stories, but don't name names, Gary. <laughs> that's, another, that's another thing on Russ's list. <laughs> Gary, you want to? I learned so much from Fred. So I came to graduate school at Carolina in uh, January of 79, always on the off season somehow. Uh, I came in 79. He, back in those days, he made all the assignments. There was, there was none of this business of, you know, 
faculty members saying, I don't want that one. No, okay. he said, you get this one and, and that, that one gets that one. And, and that was that. And he chose me as his teaching assistant. I'm coming in in the spring. He made me his teaching assistant. Uh, and wow, that, that was awesome. I learned a ton. I learned a ton about teaching, uh, all of that. Uh, um, that was awesome. And somehow during that semester, he decided that I was okay. You know, it was just like, I didn't feel like I did anything special. No, he just decided, oh yeah, this guy is, you know, in my positive bin or whatever. Uh, <laughs> and that has served me very well because if Fred Brooks thinks you're okay, you, you, you know, uh, he can convince anybody else. I think I got through a, a bunch of problems that way. Um, and so uh, it's halfway through my first semester. And he comes to me with the idea of being executive officer. <laughs> well, I can't start this summer because I promised the electric company where I was a COBOL programmer, okay, <laughs> uh, that I would work for him this summer. That'd be fine. You could start in the fall. It'll take you longer to get your degree, but you'll learn a lot. Yes, sir. And so I come back in the fall and now I'm executive officer and we, we didn't have a lot of money then. So it wasn't like it was a big budget or anything, but I did the stuff necessary to make things work. And when I got confused, it was great. So there was Fred's office, Lib's office and my office. I mean, we just right there together. So it was so great being that close to him. And so he would say, he, he, you know, I'm working on something and I don't know what to do. I'm just some kid from South Georgia. He's in there working on the floor. He, he would get down on the floor to write. He's down there writing on the floor so many times. I go in, I'm baffled. He reaches up, clicks the clock, clicks the clock. He says, what is it? I tell him one sentence. He says one sentence. Yes, sir. I've got it. He reaches up. Click. <laughs> I'm on my way. You know, so many times later when I was on the faculty, I'm working on a grant proposal for DARPA and I'm trying to make this table and I can't make the table work. I've been working on it for three days or something, rearranging it, thinking about it. He comes by, asks me how it's going. I'm stuck on this table. He comes in. He looks at it. He spends maybe five minutes looking at it. He says, oh, you're confusing applications with technologies. I say, yes, sir. I've got it. <laughs> he walks away. I just changed the character of the columns. I want to change. There I am. You know, I'm done. But he just saw straight to what the issue was, he, he's going straight to the, the core, the big question, the thing that I'm confused by. I learned so much from that. I, I'll pause there and let somebody else speak. I will add one thing about faculty meetings. Um, everybody talks about how decisive Fred was, how it got to the main point. At faculty meetings, it didn't feel that way at all. It was about discussion mm -hmm. and persuading each other of the important points. Of course, the fact that Fred had the best points and was the most <laughs> persuasive <laughs> led to some decisions that were consistent with the, the way he thought. But it was, it, the dynamic was very, very free-flowing and, and open. Yes. Ron, you want to talk? Uh, I want to mention the reading room, and that was my favorite spot in, in Citizen Hall. But what I learned was the original plan for that uh, by the architect was that was going to be Dr. Brooks's office. Okay. And if anybody actually deserved a, a lavish spot like that, it would be him as founder of the department. But he said no. He, he didn't need that. He just needed a, a regular office. And so he shared that for the benefit of the entire department. And that really impressed me. Um, it, 
you know, taught me that the truly great people, they're, they're confident in themselves and their achievement. They don't need to show off. They don't need a fancy office or other things. I mean, I live right now in, in Silicon Valley in a culture filled with arrogance and entitlement, you know, where people need those types of things to show off. And, and that, that really had a great impression on me. Second thing I want to share, uh, if you have the, the images in, in the back of the, there was the Toolsmith uh, uh, conference that occurred, yeah, okay, oh, great, um, a little over 20 years ago um, on the, on the, for Dr. Brooks's 70th birthday. So I actually brought some of the, two of the materials, that one and the next uh, slide uh, from that. But I wanted to show, share two images from that. If you go to the, the third image, um, that was a photo I took of Dr. Brooks and Ivan Sutherland, two Turing Award winners there. And then the, the next one, um, some of the, this was actually in the, in, in the Brooks house uh, of the, the kitchen. Now, some of us who actually worked on, uh, on the walkthrough project or, or were involved in it actually got to visit Dr. Brooks's house. And it was a sense of deja vu <laughs> for us, but from a different way, because we had actually experienced it in virtual reality first and not in the physical, and yet got a sense of deja vu. And I specifically brought the subjects I want to pick on Gary, who was my advisor. And Gary, for the longest time, said he had never experienced presence in a virtual environment. Okay, so one time, um, Dr. Brooks was in the room. He, he was in the, the ceiling tracker. G Gary was uh, kneeled over, kind of like this, you know, with, with the head-worn display, checking the height of one, of one of the countertops in the kitchen. And then when it's time to, to get up, you know, he <laughs> reached over like this. Okay, and of course there was nothing there because it was it was purely virtual. But Dr. Brooks said, "Hey, for a millisecond, at least you 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 were present um, in that." And I, Mary, I kind of wonder what was it were incidents like that that triggered you know you you and him leading the effective virtual environments for things to to measure presence objectively on the. Well, we we wanted to know what it was about the technology and the applications that made people, that evoked the sense of presence mm -hmm. in, in okay. people. Um, but that did lead us to build the styrofoam model of his kid. Oh, the passive haptics. Okay. The passive haptics. But there's a third thing I, I want to leverage on that, was so that, that also led to the PIT project. Um, so I'll tell you a story of how Dr. Brooks got revenge for me. Okay, I know Sharif is there. He's squirming in the, in the back. So Sharif Razak, who's sitting back over there, was a graduate student at the time. And uh, one time when I visited uh, Chapel Hill, he said, uh, Ron, you know, I, I modified this demo, you know, just for you. I, I want you to try this. It, it was the pit demo. If, if, you, if those of you are not familiar, the pit was a place where you can actually look down like, ooh, see, you know, a bit. and it could actually measure presence because people were scared. You know, you think you're going to fall down into the bo uh, bottom of this virtual they pit. Sweated, their heart uh, rates went up. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, what I learned from that is if anybody says that they modified a demo just for you, run the, the opposite way, okay? So anyway, I, I'm in there, um, and Sharif told me, you know, look down, to, to, you know, so I'm leaned over, looking over, and he, he triggers a thing to make it look like I'm falling down to the bottom of the pit and also gives me a little push uh, from behind. And by the way, don't, don't ever do this if somebody is leaning and not expecting it because I fell over. Fortunately, somehow avoided you know, breaking the very expensive head-worn display and very expensive hand, hand controller. But, you know, I fell and hit my knees and Mary was in the room. I, I'm not sure what she was thinking at that point. Well, just exactly the same thing I was when they told the story again last night at dinner. When, and the voice from the other end of the table says, Mary doesn't like thinking about this. And I said, and I particularly didn't like it the first time. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let, let, let's fast forward a, a couple months. So now Sharif is in, in, in his doctoral oral exams. And there, his committee is grilling him on, uh, I guess, the review board, IRB. What do you have to do uh, when you're using human subject experiments? And ask, you know, why do you have a review board? And he starts to answer, well, you, know, you want to make sure that when you run an experiment that people don't get hurt. And Dr. Brooks at that point interjected, I heard he was pushed. <laughs> Which then triggers an entire debate amongst uh, his uh, committee and Sharif was probably cringing somewhere in the corner. So thank you, Dr. Brooks. Ben. So the one lesson I wanted to bring up was uh, Dr. Brooks really taught us how to listen to everybody and not just a few people. So he, uh, just to show you how arrogant um, he saw some of it, like myself, was uh, when I first wanted him to be my advisor, I wrote a one-page document. This is what I wanted to do. And not knowing really his accomplishments, I walked up to him. I gave him the one-pager and go, 
do you want to advise me? And, and he just kind of looked at me, kind of laughed about it. He goes, yeah, sure, I'll do it. So, you know, I was, I was, I was obviously very full of myself, and I really thought it was doing something really, really important. I remember going to visit um, NASA Langley, and I know Samir and I differ on how we actually got there, but we had to ride in the car with Dr. Brooks, and we had to fill about seven hours worth of conversation, which was really nerve-wracking for a graduate student. But when we got there, I thought we would get walked into uh, the, you know, the, the head of the, the center's uh, office and, and get red carpet treatment, but he didn't want that. He actually made, he wanted to go down, he wanted to talk to the, uh, to the engineers on the floor, the people uh, bolting the satellite packages together. And he turned to me and he, he looked at me, he goes, they know the interesting problems, and right? And so he, he made us sit there and he, he would talk. And then finally, I guess the brass heard that we were there and they sent the entourage down. <laughs> and he says, okay, all our learning is done. I still remember <laughs> that. And he, did, he, but he really wanted to impress, and you know, especially in the graduate students, you need to focus, you need to make sure who you listen to, because it's not oftentimes the people with the great titles um, or all the fancy letters after the name, who knows the interesting problems are often the people that are working on the, on the ground floor. And I always try to hold on to that and also try to pass that on. So that was really a lesson for me. Oh, and, and just to show that he listened to everybody, I had the opportunity to actually see him um, a year ago, uh, 2021, uh, December. So I was able to visit him in his house and he, it, his, it, his wife, Nancy came and he introduced me to her and he said to her, I still remember Ben played hockey and he was a goalie. He was a really good one um, back in, you know, 21 years ago. So 21 years ago, for some reason, he held that in his mind that uh, he remembered that I played hockey. And I thought that was just such a great thing for him to, like, why are you holding on to this when you're 90 years old that some random graduate student did that? But it always reminded me that he did listen to everybody. Uh, and that, that's something I'll always remember. You know, it's pretty impressive though, that a UNC, I'm sorry, a North Carolina uh, resident got really into ice hockey. Yeah, <laughs> he actually, well, they, 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 in 2002, they finally made the Stanley Cup, the Carolina Hurricane. Yeah, right. And he said to me, you know, I've never, I don't know anything about hockey. I just know that they're in the finals. Can I come over to watch a hockey game with you? And I was a graduate student, and I was like, one, you don't say no, right? <laughs> and two, I do, I'll never forget, he, he actually came and he brought a pizza. So I actually opened the door and there's Dr. Brooks with a pizza in his hand. And yeah, we, I, I walked in there, uh, you know, I, I told my roommates, you know, hey, can you like leave us? I mean, you know, <laughs> this, I'm gonna be super nervous. And we had this tiny, tiny TV because uh, obviously I was a graduate student. And uh, yeah, he sat there and we watched a game of hockey. It was like uh, one of the Stanley Cup games, Some, they lost, but it didn't matter. But it was just something for me to say, he wanted to spend an evening with, with me and just because he wanted to learn something. And that, that really touched me. So I really appreciated him really wanting to not just listen to people, but really want to spend time to get to know somebody. And that, that was something to hold on to. All right, Gary, can you recall the story about signing a book to the press? You know it? You told it to us early years ago. <laughs> I don't remember it. Fred Thompson, somebody asked him to sign the Mythical Man Month. Does that recall it for you? No, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't remember yesterday. It's terrible. Well, it's terrible. You say, God, oh, I don't have a book signed by Dr. Fred. Maybe I should have one signed by Tommy. And then he pointed out, all of us in the department, our lives are signed by him. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like something I'd say. Uh, <laughs> the people in Zoom line may not have heard that. But it's <laughs> Um, yes, uh, Sharif, yeah, the, the folks in Zoomland may not have heard that. Uh, Sharif was reminding me of a story that I've completely forgotten. Uh, somebody was looking for the opportunity uh, for Fred to sign a copy of Mythical Man Month, Fred Brooks to sign a copy of Mythical Man Month. And somebody, maybe me, uh, said, wow, I don't have a copy of the Mythical Man Month signed by Fred. And then it dawned on me that our lives are signed by Fred Brooks, you know? Uh, I didn't need a book to be signed. Uh, no, my, my life is signed, yeah. Sounds like the kind of deep thing I would say. <laughs> so Fred had, a bunch of, Fred had a bunch of deep sayings uh, that I learned a ton from. Uh, he told a story about one time uh, at IBM 
when a craftsman did a really great job for him. I forget what kind of craftsman it was, but he needed something made, and the fellow did a great job for him. And he goes and tells the fellow. He makes a special trip to tell the fellow that was really a good job. And the fellow tells him, when I do bad, tell me. When I do good, tell my boss. <laughs> And I have used that so many times. If somebody does good for you, tell their boss. That's who you want to tell. Uh, <laughs> you can tell them too, but you want to tell their boss when they do good. Uh, I've, I've used that so many times. So Fred's organized thinking reminds me of a, of a story that he told me about him and Nancy were in a second floor apartment. I guess it was in Poughkeepsie. Uh, and uh, Nancy, besides being a physicist, is a uh, musician. Uh, and uh, they had a grand piano. And it needed to get up this stairway up into the second floor apartment. And Fred knew it was complicated and made a full-scale cardboard model. So, so he could figure out how to get this piano, turn it this way, a little ways up, turn it the other way, get up this curved stairway to the, so they could get the piano in. So then the piano movers came. And then I said, I'll tell you how to get the piano up. Uh -uh, we know, we're, we're, we're professionals. And they worked and they worked and they couldn't get it. All right, tell us. <laughs> yeah, and he told them and then that's how it got up <laughs> in, into the into their apartment. Nancy's nodding, so I guess I've told it more or less correct. <laughs> um, I, I, go ahead. I want to share one just for fun. Um, so April, uh, April Fool's Day, sometimes some of us would do pranks or various things. One April Fool's Day, someone decorated Dr. Brooks's bust with this really gaudy 1960s t-shirt and had and maybe matching tie. I don't, I don't quite remember. I promise you it was not me. I swear I was not the one who did it. I've actually never found out who actually did this. Anyway, the, the, the clothes disappear and we figure that's that, right? Till a few months later for the department picnic, when Dr. Brooks shows up wearing the horrible <laughs> tie-dye shirt and matching hat and maybe to try to suss out who actually did that. I, I don't know, did, does anyone, anybody want to confess? <laughs> this is a good time. But it showed he had a sense of humor. Mary, you want to share some more? I was just thinking about the uh, building the model and really was part of his real interest in design that showed up in the, the design of design, the second book. And um, I got a real gift from Fred and that he took a year's sabbatical to go to England and work on that book. He left me in charge. And that was when I went from being kind of a research professor I had to I had to run the research team and we had two people uh, Mike Meehan and Brett Insko who were deep in their dissertation work and so we would have the regular team meeting and then we would go to Cosmic Cantina and have a second meeting while I tried to figure out what it was to advise a, a dissertation and that's kind of a funny thing to think of as a gift but being in charge really made the difference in terms of how I learned and developed as a research faculty member. Mm -hmm. And he taught us all to be kind. <laughs> well, thank you. Ben, you want yeah, to share some more? But you talk about signing the mythical man month. I actually showed up to his, our one on one meeting. You know, usually the advisors and the grad students get a weekly meeting, and there was a line out his door, and there were people who had found, you know, found him, and their visitors on campus, and they, were, they had their copies of the book for him to sign. And he was signing it. And I was, you know, I was right behind them. And I walk in there, I go, wow, that's really amazing. He goes, yeah, it is. And then he pulled out my chapter, my dissertation. And it was full of red ink that he had totally destroyed. And I always remembered, um, and so whenever Penny told the story of how the ink was green, I don't know how it went from green to red. I actually kept a page of my dissertation that, she mar that he, he marked up. But it always reminded me how important he thought conveying one's ideas, because it wasn't just that you had an idea that was scientifically cool. You needed to convey that to other humans to consume that 
and so that they could benefit from that idea. So he really worked on me over and over and over again for a long time on how one can't just have a great idea. People need to need it, and then you have to explain and convey your idea to them. So much so that when he uh, marked up my dissertation, he actually ran out of me. And if you've ever <laughs> had a situation where somebody's marking it in front of you, and then they actually run out of ink in that moment, and they're shaking their pen, and then they throw it in the trash, and they pick up a new one, that happened to me twice. <laughs> um, it's true story. Mary knows the street. And so when I finally submitted my dissertation that he signed off on, I went to Walmart. I bought boxes of red pen because I knew I'd gone, I'd used up two of his. I bundled them up together and I gave it to him as a, as a thank you gift after he could no longer mark up my dissertation anymore. <laughs> I had submitted it to the graduate school. Um, but then afterwards, he did say that he has since uh, quit using red because he obviously saw that it had such a strong impact on him. But I, I do appreciate his, his focus on me on, I mean, he did that not because he wanted me to feel bad, right? He really wanted me to take seriously this important thing that you can't just have a good idea. You've got to help other people. You have to work on your conveying of the idea. And I think he'd worked on that even, um, you know, he never stopped working on that. That's something that I, uh, you know, hold on to still to this day. Picking up on that point, back in my day, he still had the red pen, okay? <laughs> Uh, and I got notes from him all the time as executive officer. He's telling me to do something. He's, you know, telling me to correct something, whatever. I have one piece of paper from when I was executive officer that I have saved. On this sheet of paper, there are several sets of instructions for things I need to do written in black ink. There's one line written in green ink. It says, you're doing a fine job. <laughs> That's the piece of paper I kept. <laughs> okay. I still have it because Fred didn't often tell you that you were doing a good job. And he expected you to do a good job. He, he, that's just, yeah, you performing was what you were supposed to be doing. Uh, but at least once he said, oh, yeah, you're doing a fine job. I kept that piece of paper. Mary? So I have... Um... Great memories of the first time he gave a presentation on the VR work, and he put my name on the titles. <laughs> <laughs> that was affirmation. <laughs> yeah. So, Ben, who paid uh, the fees for your dissertation when you submitted them? Uh, I, I think it, uh, whenever one has to submit their dissertation to the graduate school, you actually have to give them, it's like $35 or something like that. Uh, I didn't read that part, so <laughs> I just showed up with my dissertation on the last day. So it, it was due on a certain day, and yeah, and it, it's like, you know, they got some ridiculous deadline you have to go through, and I had no money on me, and so I, I do remember running back to Mary and, uh, you know, saying, I need $35, can I please have it, and she was, she was gracious enough. I laughed. <laughs> yes, and she said, I'm going to hold on to this story for 21 years and bring it out. <laughs> so <laughs> payment is paid and paid. <laughs> well, I, I do want to share um, the same thoughts that other other participants have said about that. You know, every person who's been to the department has been affected by by Dr. Brooks, whether directly or or indirectly, um, through the culture that he's established in the department, through the values that that he promoted. You know, the the, the sense of collaboration, the need to um, target real usages and real, real users, things like that, you know, in ways that I, I just took for granted. I didn't realize, for example, until after leaving the department that, you know, I took for granted that I could log into any workstation in the, in the department. I didn't realize until later that that's, that's unusual, you know, fiefdoms are, are, are more typical. And my hope is that that influence and in culture lives on. All right, and let me give you an example of what I, what I mean by that. Um, Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia. And apparently he was very clear about what his thoughts about what a university should be and, and what he didn't, didn't want it to be. So much so that uh, faculty in debates can say things such as, Mr. Jefferson wouldn't want that. As if Mr. Jefferson was just off, you know, riding his horse and would be later home later, you know, in the afternoon. Okay, so if Dr. Brooks's influence continues on, you know, I hope that you know, decades from now, that professors who've never actually met Dr. Brooks personally will be able, will be able to say things like, Dr. Brooks wouldn't want that. 
Okay, and if that happens, then you know part of him will live on mm -hmm. in in the department. I in, can in us, and you know we will become part of his legacy. Mm -hmm. I can verify that at least at now the collegiality of the faculty, the, the spirit of support of each other and support of the students very much lives on. The, uh, the, the, the way in, it was mentioned, uh, I think by Steve Weiss earlier, uh, that we can disagree and nevertheless agree uh, not to be disagreeable uh, is, is really, really the case. And this makes being a faculty member uh, a, a joy. Uh, we, uh, we have a uh, long, long uh, experience of discussing every faculty candidate, for example, as a group which every single faculty member gets a chance to, to say what their opinions are and then we, we uh, consider together with, we're doing it the way we have always done it. Uh, and, and I won't go on with more examples, but the point is that uh, I, I believe you will see uh, in the next, uh, if you come in 10 years from now, that, that you will still see that, that spirit of the department that uh, Fred established. More and stories, any folk, anybody? Okay, then I'm going to uh, make a few thanks and uh, close this session, this uh, day. Uh, first of all, I want to particularly thank the, the ER team uh, who did the organization of the day on, on the administrative side and such a heck of a lot of work, especially Melissa Gunnell and Aaron Lane and, and Brett Piper, who was very much involved in the organization of the demos that took place last night. Uh, secondly, uh, Jim Mahaney. Uh, I can't tell you the, the number of activities that Jim organized for this, uh, but uh, the setup of the demos uh, was very much his responsibility and uh, with the help of Brett and working with the Friday Center. The, uh, first of all, let, multiple people have told us how impressed they are with the, with the staff at the Friday Center, the way things have gone today with the audiovisual system and on and on and absolutely impressive. Uh, but, but that happened because arrangements that Jim made with them. Um, Latasha Mingo, who uh, is, uh, was responsible for the budgetary and admi administrative efforts. Uh, this day is, uh, took a lot of uh, budget and administration, and a major fraction of the money was provided by the provost of the university and the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and we thank them very much for their support. <clears throat> Um, a few of us suggested this event uh, and um, approached Samarji Chakraborty, our, our chairman, uh, and immediately said, oh, by all means, we, we need to do it. How, how big is it going to be? Uh, and where, where shall we do it? And so on. Uh, he um, supported us with a light hand and was and and was his support was very important you heard from him at the beginning uh, the four faculty leaders who who designed the day have basically chose the panelists and so on that was mary uh, and gary and henry fuchs and me uh, and i thank them for all the work that, that we did uh, for this general pen and we want to thank all the panelists that uh, that took part. There's, I must say, it's been a, a marvelous day from my point of view. Um, we are going to close by hearing, as we started, from Fred. 
uh, after which there'll be time for further social contact uh, out in the atrium. And at, at the very beginning, when we leave this auditorium, we're being asked to congregate for a group photo out there. And then we'll all be able to stay, stand around and, and spend time with each other further as we want to do. So thanks, thank you all. Anything else you'd like to tell us? Any other stories come to mind while we've been talking here? Well, I, I have been blessed with opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, what do you have that you were not given? And that's true of family background, education, native brains, wife and children, all given, given, given. So I would say that's, that's what I'm thankful for every morning. Mm -hmm. Another thing I'm thankful for every morning is David says in the Psalms, the normal lifespan is 70 and the, the, the exceptional lifespan is 80. So every morning when I get up, I say, thank you, Lord, for bonus. Day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> bonus time. A bonus, bonus time. time. Yes. So I've written some, I'm not writing any more books. The, the design of design, which summarized essays, summarizing my design experiences across many media um, is the last one to be published, but I've written a set of essays for the grandchildren, autobiographical essays. And I'm calling that following David, another David Psalm. The lines for me have fallen in pleasant places. They're just at, at every point, things have been really, really good. And I'm very thankful for that. Yes, we are too. All right, this has been a Turing Award like, uh, interview with Dr. Frederick Phillips Brooks, Junior, Junior, on March twelfth, twenty twenty, in his house in Chapel Hill. Thank you.